Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who selected Israel from all the peoples and gave them your Torah to be a light to the Gentiles. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. As Simeon the priest declared after seeing the newborn Yeshua, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Luke chapter 2, verses 30 to 32. Shalom Torah Club members, this is Boaz Michael, and joining me once again is Toby Janicki. We'll be working through this Torah portion with you today. This Parsha is a Parsha Kiddushim, and it comes from Leviticus, and we're working through this text together. Um, again, I just want to uh, thank you for your participation in the program. This is one of my favorite sections of the Torah, and I think that it's, it's one of my favorites because it's so practical. Um, every section as you go through Kiddushim is just like, it's relevant, it's it's a part of humanity, it's a part of our life, it can instruct us and inform us and help shape us into the image of Messiah, the living Torah, but also inform us of what God means in, refer- in reference to holiness and holy living. There's quite a number of commandments in this Parsha. There is. Um, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 says that we're to be imitators of God. So not only are we to be disciples of Yeshua, imitating His actions, following in His ways, uh, reflecting His life, all those type of things, we also in these instances get an opportunity to see um, God's character and, and God's intention with His Torah on a very practical human level. And and, um, and we're to imitate that, and we're to imitate God's actions and God's heart, and we can do so very easily through um, living a life of faithfulness to the commandments of God. So we're going to be looking at a couple uh, sections from Rabbi Polishkin's book, Love Your Neighbor. And the first one comes from Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 through 2. And uh, let me read the text, and then I'll give you the statement, and we'll kind of work that uh, work through that. Here's the text. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the generations of the sons of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus 19, 1 and 2. So here's uh, Rabbi Pliskin's explanation. He says, God commanded Moses to state this verse in front of the entire congregation, that is, in an assembly, because the majority of the essentials of the Torah are summarized herein. The Chatam Sofer commented that to attain holiness, one need not be isolated and withdrawn from the rest of society. On the contrary, the admonition to be holy was stated in an assembly. A person must learn how to sanctify himself by behaving properly amongst people. So what he's saying here is the the commandment speak to the entire congregation of Israel that this section, as you were saying, which is so important and has many of the essentials of the Torah and community life and ethics and, and living out godliness is delivered to the entire community, not just individuals or or separately. Uh, he brings out uh, Pliskin brings out a story that I, I'd like to read um, about this. He says, Someone once asked the Hazon Ish if he thought it advisable to go into isolation in order to study Torah without any distractions and interruptions. This is how the Hazon Ish answered. My heart cannot believe that by being isolated from everyone, you can acquire a true acquisition of Torah. It is quite obvious that society and friends will assist you. So he believed, the Zonish believed that when you live in a community that you're, you're learning from others, and that is a true acquisition of a Torah lifestyle. I would add to that that not only that, but it's only within the community situation that you're tested and tried. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a commandment of the Torah that talks about wearing zitzit. There's a, a famous rabbi named of Ibn Ezra. And by Ibn Ezra's day, this was in the Middle Ages, that the, that, uh, the Jewish people stopped wearing zitzits 
all day long, and they only wore them on a tallit in morning prayers. And the, and the Ibn Ezra chastised them, and he said, you, he said, that's not the time of day when you need to look at those tzitzits and be reminded of God's commandments. You, you'll come to this when you reach uh, the study of Numbers ch- chapter 15. But he said, that's not the time of day when, I need, when anyone needs to be reminded of the commandments because you're right there in God's presence and you're praying and you're focusing. It's all the rest of the day. And I think this is the same way. When we're studying on our own and we've feel good about what we're learning, that's not the true test. That's not the true trial. The true test is to take what we learn when we're studying and then live it out in everyday life. You know, I, sometimes I've said I could be a totally righteous person. I could be a tzaddik if I didn't come have to come in contact with a single other person. I'm saying that facetiously, of course, but, you know, but really you're not living a life of holiness unless that lifestyle is tried and tested. I really appreciated you bringing out the, <clears throat> the idea that not only in the in the context of a community, do we like sharpen one another in terms of like, like shared learning, shared information, shared knowledge. And that's a a beautiful aspect of community. But at the same time, there's also when you're within a community, um, the opportunities to be hurt, um, be disrespected, felt unimportant or whatever it may be. And to see how in those instances, we're going to react yeah, um, and how we're going to respond. Are we going to respond in the times of, of learning in a positive way? Or are we going to respond in the times of hurt in a positive way? So community is essential in regards to Torah life. And I love how Rabbi Plushkin pulls that, that just that little nugget out that says, speak to all of the congregation, meaning collect everybody together because I'm giving a rule and precepts here that applies to a community of people. Mm-hmm. This is how you're to interrelate and act and treat one another. So throughout this portion, you see issues of honoring one another, loving one another, doing justice with one another, respecting one another, because that's the heart of the Torah. Well, you even look at God himself, what he desired with creating the earth, uh, you know, in the in the Hasidic mindset in Judaism, God needs us. You know, we so often focus, God doesn't need us. You know, he can do anything he wants. Well, why did he create us? Because he needs us. He wants to interact and connect with us. So the, the whole act of creation is about community and relationships. I mean, we see the very first man, he was alone and he was incomplete. All the other animals had spouses, if I could use that word with animals. And he was incomplete until Eve comes and completes him. And the same is with the aspect of community. Outside of community, we are incomplete. The tendency is that knowledge puffs up, that becomes a person becomes arrogant, and through arrogance, there becomes separation, Mm -hmm. isolation, and like distancing from community. And I think the tendency is when people learn. So when we learn about Torah, when we're, you know, we we're given more information than what we had a year ago, two years ago, and we start to grow and learn about the ways of Torah as it reflects upon our faith in Messiah. The tendency is, is to want to withdraw from community relations within a church or people that we disagree with or disagree with yeah. us yeah. and isolate ourselves away from those contexts for spiritual purity, for, you know, protection of, of, of ourselves, so to speak, from a in, being influenced, our children being influenced. However, the Torah, or to expand that, the Word of God was given to a nation of people, mm-hmm. and then not only a nation of people, the Jewish people, but those that attach themselves to the Jewish people, and it's intended to be like were to, intended to be together yeah. and to respect one another and grow with one another and those type of things. So um, isolation ultimately leads to destruction. You know, I'm reminded of, uh, I, can't, I seem to have a lot of stories in me today, 
I, uh, I'm reminded of, of two more uh, stories or teachings of the sages. The one is, this is a perfect illustration of this. I can't remember the rabbi's name or anything. It's not important. There was a congregate in a particular synagogue, and he kind of became disgruntled with what was going on, and he decided he would just, instead of going to synagogue on Shabbat, he would just stay home. So the rabbi came and visited him during the week, and he said to the congregant, he said, mm-hmm. you know, wh- why aren't you coming in? Why aren't you being with the community? And he said, and he said, uh, you know, I, I can do the prayers at home. I can do all this by myself and get just as much done. And, and then I don't have to deal with all the junk on the side. And so the rabbi was very smart. He realized there was nothing really he could say at that point that would change this guy's mind. So he said, where's your stoker for the fire? And so the, the congregant said, here, he gave it to the rabbi. And the rabbi poked the fire that was there and he pushed it and a huge ember came out of the fire and landed on the floor in front of the fireplace. And, and, and the rabbi said, watch the ember. And the ember within a few seconds died down and went away. And he said, see, when the ember is in the fire, in the community, it stays lit. But when it comes outside of the community, it's fire can't stay lit. And Mm -hmm. I thought that was really, that's, that's Mm -hmm. that whole idea that in the fire, in the community, we're being strengthened. Um, the other story I was thinking of is the sages talk about the incense and all the different fragrances that went into the incense. There's one particular ingredient of the incense that stinks. It's foul smelling. You know, if you were to smell it alone, it stinks. But you put it in with the others and it smells beautifully. And the teaching that the sages use is that the incense is like prayer. When the community's together, you need everybody together. Even that person that you think stinks, that you think is a a stinky person inside their actions, when you put them in the context of a community, that adds to the prayers and makes them beautiful. So every component, whether you think you're a worthy component or not, you need to be a part of that community. Those are excellent stories. I was hoping you would tell the story about the ember, because when you started saying, I have a story, I thought, I have a story too. (laughs) So that's a great illustration. Here's a text out of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. It says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So this text out of Hebrews is really applicable to us, and it kind of helps like, like substantiate the idea of a New Testament community, so to speak, is also intended to be together, stimulating one another, growing together, assembling together. And it addresses the fact that there are some that pull back, yeah, that pull out of that context of the community. And when you pull out of the context of the larger community, when you isolate yourself, there is, um, there is, there, there's, there's, potential for tremendous problems, not only like within the group itself, the small little isolated group, but I oftentimes think that people don't think through the generational aspect of what that represents in terms of our children and the impact that that makes and the message it sends and all those type of things. So it's critical that we stay connected to the community and we deal with the diversity of the community Mm -hmm. in a godly and respectful way, which is really the heart of what's taking place here in Kiddoshim. You know, I think if we look at the text of Hebrews, I try to think of the context, and I can think of two contexts. One thing that we forget is that the way that this was, the way that the community was structured is they didn't have a messianic synagogue. They didn't have a church. The deal was on Shabbat, you went to synagogue and you prayed with the community, the rest of the community, both believing and unbelieving uh, Jewish people. Well, everybody believed in something, but mm-hmm. believers in Messiah, they're all all followers of the God of Israel. You prayed with those people. And then during the week, they would meet in homes. So I could think two things could have been going on here. Number one is they decide, well, we're meeting during the week with believers. We don't need to meet with greater Israel anymore. Or they're meeting with, uh, they're meeting during the, they're meeting on Shabbat and they say it's too much of a hassle to get together with believers during the week. And I I can see kind of two homiletical points here. Number Mm -hmm. one, you need to be with like-minded people. That's during the week. You need to be with those other believers. And second of all, 
They needed to be in the synagogue, not only to worship God, but to be a light for Messiah. Mm -hmm. We need to not isolate ourselves from community of like-minded believers, and we need to not isolate ourselves from places where we can be a light. It's great if we have a community and we're isolated in that community, however large it is. Mm -hmm. But if we're not going out and being a light for Messiah, then it's just as wrong as not being part of the community. That's a perfect segue <clears throat> that gives me greater confidence to share what I'm about to share. <laughs> um, you know, my wife and our family a attend a church from time to time here on a local level. And the primary purpose of it is to connect with the local community. Not that the church necessarily either affirms what we believe and like tickles our ears, but rather we do it for the purpose of relationship with the larger body and connection to the larger body with the ultimate intention of being a light within the framework of that community. So, um, when we're there, when we're able to attend, which is fairly infrequently because of our schedule and those type of things, um, they have a, a certain time each uh, Sunday morning when the pastor will say, turn around and greet the people next to you. I think I discussed this in a few lessons ago. And there's a gentleman that every time comes up to us, and he's a gray-headed man. And he'll walk up to shake my hand, and I'll stand up to shake his hand. And Every time he says, you don't have to do that. You don't have to stand up. Stay seated. Stay seated. I said, oh, no, sir. I do have to stand up to, to greet you. Yeah. So Plishkin pulls out another thing here. And it comes from the text that says, you shall rise up before the gray headed and honor the aged. You shall revere your God. I am the Lord, your God. So I stand in the presence of this gray headed man that's greeting me for the purpose of fulfilling this commandment that says you are to stand before the presence of the gray headed, or you could interpret it as saying you're to demonstrate respect towards your elders. Polish, Polishkin uh, offers it up this way. He says, we are obligated to honor Torah scholars and not only Torah scholars, but he pulls out the aged, the yeah. elderly. You know, I think that that's, you know, we were talking last week, or no, it was the week, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, something, about honoring your leaders. And I, you know, that, that this is something I don't, you know, I, I know we, I want to stress honoring the aged, because certainly we live in a society and a culture that idolizes youth. And, and young people, and we don't honor the aged enough. But I think the same thing is with, with our leaders, especially I see people that, that get into Torah and, that, and, and, and we start studying the Torah and we suddenly see that maybe our pastor or our teacher doesn't know as much as we thought they did. And we start feeling better than them. And we start to feel like that. And then we get this whole concept that no man deserves honor because mm -hmm. everybody falls short. But the Torah is very clear that people in places of authority and in places of honor uh, I'm, I, you know, places of, of position, they deserve our honor and they deserve our respect. So, you know, uh, Pliskin pulls out, there's about 13 principles in here, and I don't know how we have time to go through all of them, but, he, you know, he talks about standing up for a Torah scholar. Um, he, he talks about, you know, uh, taking care of them, trying to, trying to meet their needs. It's really a shame when people in the ministry have to ask for things because if we had our things in priority, when we saw a great teacher or someone, we would offer them honor and we would want to meet and take care of their needs. And I know in a, in a Jewish community, this is very much, mm -hmm. you know, you honor your leader, you honor your, uh, you, you know, you, you, you honor the rabbi. And what's funny is I think in a lot of traditional churches, they have this too, because I remember always hearing like, you know, for, for our pastor's birthday, we gave him a trip to Israel. It seems like in the Messianic communities, you know, in the Hebrew roots communities, you get the you get the short end of the stick. You mm -hmm. don't get honored in the way of the church, and you don't get, you know you're mm -hmm. just you're you're kind of treated like uh, one of the boys. And I, and I think there's a level of of respect and honor that we need to kind of get back to. Mm -hmm. I think um, a good term is um, over familiarity. Yeah, that we're not to be over familiar, so to speak, with our leaders. Meaning, like they're we should have this sense that there is, and not only our leaders, it's not about leadership. It's about, I would say, people that are due respect mm -hmm. because of their age 
and because of their 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 maturity and their achievement throughout life, even if we disagree with it, the fact that they've progressed through life and they've been like successful in in God's eyes and those type of things, they deserve our respect, and we need to be careful to demonstrate respect to them in every area. But we, you know, in our society, our teens have a sense of familiarity with adults meaning that they th- they think of themselves as peers mm-hmm. and they treat adults as their peers the way they speak to them the way they address them the way they act around them and that is improper and it and and I think we can all see how that type of familiarity has eroded like a society to where there's no longer respect for anyone. There's no longer respect for, for peers and there's no longer respect for elders because we haven't put in place simple things. Yeah. Simple things is what the Torah says here is standing in the presence of the gray headed. If, if we are to implement that and to, uh, you know, uh, with my sons, I've, I've actually implemented this with my sons and my daughters in which I've instructed them in this way. And probably nine times out of 10, they do it. And that one time that they don't do it, I remind them that they should have stood uh, and shook this guy's hand mm-hmm. or greeted them or yeah. whatever. But but just that simple practice begins to like give this, this, this uh, um, awareness of mind to be respectful in other areas. So one little thing that is practiced as a discipline yeah. then becomes a greater principle that finds itself in other areas of their life. Yeah, it, you know, and we it's not only standing. I mean, I think about, you know, you're having a party and everybody's sitting down and somebody older than you walks in, immediately your thought should be they can have my seat. Mm-hmm. It's it's a courtesy. You know, and again, in today's world, we're so focused on youth and you know, I I appreciate there's a, a kind of a renewed focus on educating children and making things kid friendly, but sometimes it's at the expense of the honor due to the elderly and to the adults, mm-hmm. and and we really need to keep that intact. I mean, you know, sometimes people will say, "Well, I have a you know, I know this. My grandfather is not a godly man, and I can't you know." The Torah doesn't say. If they're godly, give them honor. The Torah says if they're gray-headed, they have earned the right of respect. Mm-hmm. And, and let God judge mm-hmm. you know, their actions, whatever. But it's up to us, no matter who they are, to give them honor and to give them respect because they have seen a heck of a lot more in this lifetime than we have. Mm-hmm. So I encourage you Torah Club members to spend a lot of time here in Kiddushim this week. You know, Read through this section, Leviticus 19, and really just look at every one of these mitzvot and how they can they can apply to your life and how you can become a greater reflector of God's character and the life of Messiah. And as the Apostle Simon Peter admonishes us, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Master and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen.